Yeah. How about now? Yeah, Microphone good. working? Yeah. yeah cool. Mike, yes. Uh, I'm a big Bill Withers fan. And there's a live video of him wearing a pineal t shirt, and I love it. It's a, it says on the t shirt, I think, right? A music theater camp place. All right. Oh. Okay. <laughs> wow it's almost right it's almost too perfect a description of what's about to happen <laughs> okay cool oh, it's good to know thanks well on that note um, <laughs> on that bombshell <laughs> A hand from <laughs> from one garbage dump. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, so yeah, it's my my pleasure to next introduce uh, Professor Mike Fowler, um, who's a, a professor at the Department of Biosciences in Swansea University in the UK. Um, and Mike does, as as you may be able to tell from his Twitter handle, all kinds of theoretical ecology stuff, um, but particularly has done a lot of work on stochasticity and environmental noise and color of noise and this kind of stuff. And so I'm yeah excited to hear about. Uh, stability in unstable dynamics. So please, Mike, take it away. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks a lot to, to Sam and, and the OIST uh, team for, for the invitation. I'm really enjoying myself so far. Um, a really exciting group of people to be dis discussing this with. So uh, thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to describe myself as, as somebody who likes to break things. Um, I should have been an engineer because you can put simple engineering things back together more easily than you can put biological things back together when you're trying to understand how they work. Um, but that's why I'm, I, it's safer to let me play with theory and, and models rather than real organisms. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, uh, yeah, what happens when we start thinking about noise or environmental variation in systems that include at least some elements that are not stable. Uh, so let's see if we can do this. I'll start again by uh, thanking my collaborators over decades now. Uh, I'm showing my age. Um, there's, there's been a really great team uh, involved with the, the couple of projects I'm going to talk about today. So I'll, uh, I won't go through, through them all by name, but they're all lovely people. That's one of the advantages of working in biology. So there's a very high proportion of very nice, intelligent, fun, good people. Uh, and there's a mathematician who falls into that category down here as well. Cheng Wei is uh, our team mathematician. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to talk about a couple of projects today. One was my previous favorite project, the first one, and the second one is is my current favorite project. Um, looking at uh, yeah temporal stability around biomass fluctuations. Tad touched upon that a little bit. Uh, when you maybe touched upon it as well, I can't remember now, so many talks to, to filter through. Um, temporal stability of biomass fluctuations, so that's another type of stability with some relation to what Karen was just talking about as well. Um, in simple models with some unstable species level dynamics, and then the second part is going to be confronting much more biologically uh, and environmentally realistic, but still mathematical models. Um, uh, with some experiments that collaborators and leads have been uh, uh, have been carrying out over a few a few years, right? So to start with the simple project or simple uh, study system, uh, I'm going to talk about discrete time population models rather than uh, Karen was talking talking mostly about continuous time models. I you know there's 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 almost two camps among theoretical ecologists about which you which flavor you prefer to have. I think there's good reasons for using both of them uh, under the right circumstances. I normally would say that discrete time models are really useful for organisms with discrete breeding seasons or discrete breeding cycles or something like that. So there's a fixed time where they reproduce and then the rest of the year, some of them are kind of dying off, but then a year later or a breeding cycle later, a uh, generation later, something like that, they, they, they reproduce again. You've got this sort of synchronous burst of of reproduction 
and then uh, deaths can happen continuously throughout the rest of the time. Um, so those work well in 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 those kind of uh, or for those kind of organisms. Um, I'm using the Ricker function, which is a kind of discrete version of, of the logistic growth function in continuous time. Every so often, I'm going to add some environmental variability, some noise. I'll use those terms interchangeably, probably. Um, and we know, you know, we know quite a lot about how these systems behave. Um, if you've got, uh, you can set your uh, intrinsic growth rate, so your maximum reproductive rate, basically, uh, to some lower or higher value and lead to slowly growing populations or kind of rapidly growing populations that overshoot some attractor, some equilibrium point in the system. Um, and yeah, that's what we've got down here, a, a carrying capacity or a, a long-term equilibrium density. I've, I've scaled that to equal one, just so I can ignore it. Um, and don't need to keep remembering to tweak those parameters in my code largely. Um, if we look across a much wider range of intrinsic growth rates, so here we've got a small difference between uh, density independent birth and death, rate, death rates on the left-hand side, and we've got a large difference on, on the right-hand side. So we're producing many more offspring than are dying uh, in the absence of any competition. That's what this R parameter is telling us about. Um, and we can, we can look at the sort of typical dynamics that come out of that across these uh, a range of these values going from um, when R is less than two, uh, we go from stable long-term dynamics and they might approach that in slightly different ways, whether it's uh, overcompensatory, overcompensatory damp fluctuations or uh, whether it's a slower undercompensating group, uh, approach to the equilibrium. Um, or we could have a two-point cycle uh, on the right-hand side and that, that in itself is a, a new sort of stable equilibrium, uh, or we could have some sort of chaotic attractor here um, as, as different types of dynamics that so you can see in the simplest versions of these discrete time models, you can't necessarily see in an equivalently simple continuous time model. So we can link that, as I said, that these dynamical differences to real biological behaviors in terms of the, the breeding structure or breed timing of breeding in natural populations. Um, we can also add interspecific interactions into these sorts of models. So we're, instead of just considering a single species, we can consider multi-species dynamics and uh, we can either simulate these or we can, we can find some things with, uh, without having to simulate, find some features of the system without having to simulate. So we can find a vector of equilibrium dynamics. And as long as everybody in the system has a positive equilibrium dynamic, we call that a feasible system. And then we can do a little bit more uh, mathematics uh, dealing with Jacobian matrices, sometimes called community matrices, which is maybe, in my opinion, an unhelpful extra term that confuses me all the time and other people. Um, and we can deal with eigenvalues, as, as Karen was talking about, to define when uh, when an equilibrium state is going to be locally stable. Um, and uh, I think I, I, I kind of agree with your characterization of these locally stable equilibria points as, or that, that method of finding it as of limited utility in real world systems. Um, so that's, yeah, something, something we have in common across the talks. Um, yeah, I won't go any further into the technical details. I'll go on to the point where we add some noise or some environmental variability onto these models. So I'm talking about year-to-year -year changes in temperature, mean temperature, or mean precipitation, or something that's important to your biology. Um, and we're just adding it on to the end of the, the, the deterministic equation that we had. And we commonly draw these environmental um, terms from a normal distribution with some fixed mean, which I've set to zero here, and some variance uh, around the mean. And um, the classic work tends to deal with feasible and locally stable deterministic communities and then add some noise onto that. And they are bouncing around, the, their dynamics are bouncing around that equilibrium, but tending to try and get back to that equilibrium where they can. Um, and the classic result, this is a, 
paper by Lehman and Tillman, and there's many other papers that sort of show the same thing, is that as you increase the number of species in your system, uh, you also increase the temporal stability of total biomass fluctuations. So if you add the, the abundances of all species together um, each year, and then uh, take the variance of that across years, we tend to see an increase in the stability, so a reduction in the, the variability of these systems as we add species to it. And there's various different mechanisms that are put forward to, to describe that. Insurance and portfolio effects uh, are, are kind of about uncorrelated um, random variables cancelling each other out. There's covariance effects, which is breaking things down. Maybe they do that over here into what's happening at the individual level, spe individual species level in terms of the changes in the mean biomass and the variability of individual species as we increase species richness, things like this. Um, one of the, the really important results um, to describe this increasing temporal stability with increasing diversity comes from Tony Ives and colleagues in a 1999 paper which said that as long as things aren't perfectly correlated in how they respond to the environment, then you're going to see some of that kind of statistical averaging or that cancelling out just because of the randomness inherent in the, uh, the species responses to a changing environment. Uh, I'm going to skip over these slides because we'll come back to them at the end if, if, if necessary. Okay, so one of the things I kind of picked up on when learning about these, uh, these behaviours was when people are building models, they tended to only look at adding more stable, more species to the system that had stable dynamics. So a lot of this work is done in purely competitive systems, and you just add another species that in the absence of um, any species interactions would go to a stable equilibrium and stay there. Um, and I started wondering if that's, that's a reasonable approach. Um, can we start to include species with different sorts of dynamics in the system uh, and add them to the community and, and see what, what happens there. And there's some kind of uh, empirical justification for that from natural systems or even from, uh, from lab experiments where we, we start to see chaos uh, in microbial food webs. People have done the experiments with insects where they show chaos and other sorts of dynamics as well. And they can manipulate mortality rates and change the dynamics in, those, in these lab systems. And there's also kind of maybe increasing evidence for chaotic dynamics or, or species that show chaotic dynamics or unstable dynamics in natural systems uh, in the real world as well. So I think that's justification for throwing some of those species into models and seeing what comes out. Um, I mentioned a second ago that we're also interested in species environmental responses. So they might be completely uncorrelated across uh, different species. So if, if we just plot the time series across the top here, um, either th those species are responding to the same environmental variable like temperature in completely separate ways, or they're responding to two totally independent environmental signatures. One might be temperature, one might be humidity or precipitation or frost days, well, that's related to temperature. Um, but yeah, conceptually, I think these are almost interchangeable. This is maybe something we're gonna be discussing in the, in the group this week. Uh, we plot the kind of scatter plot of these two environmental signals or the responses, species responses to these signals that are completely uncorrelated. We can tweak that correlation to anything we want between zero and, and one. We can make some of them negative, but not all of them. So let's just stick between zero and one for now and you know, increase them so that they're almost perfectly correlated there's a very strong correlation between them, but still some, some scatter around that relationship. So those are the two examples I'm going to look at in the first project. Um, so what are we doing here? On the left-hand column, I'm going to uh, consider three species. In the first panel, there's no competition between them. So this is three species. The first one grows. The green one grows rapidly and overshoots and then eventually settles down to an equilibrium. The red one just approaches it rather quickly and settles on it without overshooting. And the blue one approaches slowly uh, and then settles on the same equilibrium in the absence of competition. Um, we can switch competition on and 
their approach changes a little bit to the equilibrium, but they find a new but still stable constant equilibrium. Uh, we can do the same thing with uh, species with higher growth rates. So one of the species here, the green one, probably has a very high growth rate, something like three. Uh, the red and the blue ones probably have stable growth rates, less than two. Um, and as long as there's no competition between them, they will reflect, their fluctuations will reflect uh, their original growth rates, either they're kind of fluctuating chaotically or they've approached that stable attractor in the system. If we turn competition on, so they're all slowing each other's per capita growth rates down or population growth rates down, then they do start to, we can make them approach a feasible, locally stable, and in, in this case, a globally stable equilibrium point. So um, we can, without breaking some of the rules of the previous research, which assumed that the whole community would be feasible and locally stable, we can, we can do that, but we can include species in them that have got very different dynamics, a wider range of dynamics than we saw before. Then we can turn on some environmental variation in both cases. Uh, yeah, we've got exactly the same environmental signal affecting both of these two different communities. And then we can look at the distribution of total biomass abundances across time, and we can assign some value. We can look at the standard deviation of that. And it looks like it's a little bit smaller, so it's a bit more stable when we um, only have low R value species or slowly, relatively slowly growing species in the system than if we have high R value species. Um, so we're, we're remaining within the bounds of some of the work that's been done before on this, um, but we're also pushing some of the other bounds and another axis about who's being included in the, in the system. And the, uh, the take home message here, or part of the take home message is that um, if we have totally uncorrelated responses to the environment, increasing the number of species in the system will, uh, I've said, decrease total biomass fluctuations. So this, this is the inverse of the standard deviation of, of the biomass fluctuation. So this is a stability. So low values here are less stable than high values on that axis. So increasing the number of species in the system, when they all respond differently to the environmental uh, variation is stabilizing. That's the original uh, classic result that we've seen lots of times before. If we start making them respond rather similarly to the environmental change, then we can flip that to a decreasing uh, relationship. And uh, so adding a species will tend to increase the size of total biomass fluctuations. So we've lost that stabilizing effect of adding species. The two dotted and dashed lines here, I'm not gonna go into that in great detail, but I, the Ricker model has got linear density dependence in it. And I looked at another model, Maynard smith slatkin model that has non-linear density dependence just to see if that changed anything. And it doesn't really change anything. We, we don't lose that qualitative shift in the results. So for me, that was quite a nice example of breaking the original result. We, we could break it and we know why we can break it um, in some respects. Uh, we can look at how the species level, population level variances change as you add species to the system. And we can look at the covariances, the relationship between species abundances over time. And these are, these are kind of more almost phenomenological uh, explanations or patterns which help us understand what's going on. But we don't know why we get these patterns out of them. So I'm not going to focus on them for very long. I'm going to think about the distribution of um, our values in small or intermediate or large communities. So as you're increasing the number of species in the system, you start to be able to get more species with high growth rates in the system, high R values. Um, and then we can ask how that starts to interact with environmental correlation. On the left-hand panel uh, panels, we've got zero correlation in their environmental response, the right-hand panels, we've got much higher correlation. Uh, and we start to see, you know, if you, if you just pick one species with an R value of one, for example, and compare it with a, a, a second species in the same community that's got a higher R value, we can ask what's the correlation between their abundances. And we get very different patterns in these uh, correlations, depending on how strong the, uh, the, correl the environmental correlation is. Um, and that, that gives us another insight into why we get these, uh, that flip in 
the um, the diversity stability relationship because we've got really synchronous uh, fluctuations in species abundances, and those will tend to be they'll amplify the total biomass uh, population or total community biomass across time when they're so highly synchronized like that. Okay. Um, I'm not going to focus on this. I found these two papers, and we were just talking about one of them in the in the lab just now. Um, I think this is another aspect of this diversity stability debate that these two papers almost touch on, but don't quite touch on. But I think there is evidence that these kind of this um, positive diversity stability relationship isn't maybe expected to be universal. There's lots of different models that show it, but um, I'm not sure how how strong the empirical evidence for it is. Um, so a quick summary here is adding dynamical diversity into your uh, communities can qualitatively, qualitatively change these classic diversity stability results, that positive diversity stability relationship. Um, so including the chaotic or cyclic species will decrease total biomass stability when uh, the species show a high correlation in the environmental responses and the increased competition in the larger communities dampens down the otherwise high deterministic fluctuations that you'd see. And these resonate synchronously, synchronously when the environment varies over time. And the real take home message, I think, for, from this part is, you know, all teams have got members with different skill sets. And the important thing is try not to be uh, too chaotic because that ruins things for everybody. And we'll come back to that in the second part of this talk. Um, so yeah, I, I think we're, we're seeing that it's hard to predict the precise environmental impacts on, on populations because these are massively com complex systems. All the models that we built, we build around them are highly simplified. And that, that can be you know, a food web model, but even if we can break down the individual species within that food web into something like a larvae pupil adult stage. And even that's a simplification because We've got different instars within the larval stage, and we could we could build models that incorporate that. So there's massive complexity. There's all sorts of different ways information or energy or environmental fluctuations can pass through these systems. Uh, it's a mess. Um, so the, the other project I'm talking about today is we we're using a, a more complex um, mathematical modeling framework, which I'll introduce shortly. Uh, but we're using a very simple simple, well-understood uh, host parasitoid system, uh, which leads, um, Steve Satan leads has been working on for 20 something years, I think. So he's a great collaborator. He, he knows a lot about what's going on in these species. Um, we've got the Indian meal moth, which is a globally distributed pest species. Um, you find it everywhere uh, from chocolate biscuit factories to uh, subsistence farmers, grain stores. Um, and it just gets around. Uh, this is potentially a biocontrol agent, the uh, parasitoid wasp. We can maybe use that to control it. But actually, these two things can coexist pretty happily. Uh, so it's not always such a successful one. We might want to understand what are the environmental conditions that, that promote the success of this as a, as a biocontrol agent. But I'm, I'm not really going to go into that. I just like playing with the models. Um, so let's see if this will play. Nope. Let's try again. Yeah. So this is a very fast video. We've got our wasp uh, searching the environment until it finds uh, a, a prey item or a, a consumer. It's already done the, uh, the important business. It's already laid its egg. It happens so quickly. I'll maybe play it again just to let you see. Ooh, let me see what's going on. Right, so it's it's searching, it's uh, finding, and it's now injecting the egg into the caterpillar, the moth caterpillar, and it's already happened. It's a super fast uh, reaction. The, the the larvae often try and bury into the whatever the food stuff is that they're in um, to avoid detection by these these wasps. Um, but it's it's yeah, it's a nice system. It can be kept in little you know takeaway boxes in the lab. You can vary the environment in all sorts of different ways, and that's one of the things we've started. To do the previous experiment, uh, the experimental work in this stuff has been done in constant environments. We were interested in looking at what happens when you change temperatures every day, let's say. Um, 
And I've been previously interested in uh, coloured stochastic processes. So how quickly does, does some environmental signal change over time or space or both? Um, but I'm going to limit it to time here. Um, and the traditional way is to think about white environmental variation or white noise processes where there's no correlation across time in how the environment is changing. Um, the other way to think about this is the, the diff different dominant frequencies uh, in analogy with visible light. And white light has no dominant frequencies. Everything is a fairly re equal representation across the, the different frequencies. Blue light shows rapid changes across time and space. Um, in that case, high frequencies are dominating, just like blue, blue light in the natural world or visible light. Uh, and red light shows, or red noise shows um, slower changes uh, low frequencies are dominating in this case. Um, and the, the other way we can represent that is the correlation between consecutive values of the environmental state. So a negative autocorrelation is, is found in blue lights, white light has zero correlation, and red light or red environmental signals has a positive autocorrelation. So these are the, the different ways of representing that, that, these sort of different colors of noise or light or whatever you like. Um, and we look out in the normal world, we can start to estimate the, uh, the changes over time. If, the, if you look at the North Atlantic Oscillation, it's basically a white noise process, um, or it was up until year 2000, maybe it's changed since then. Um, the sea surface temperatures in the, in the Pacific, uh, if you measure them monthly, look like a much more reddened process uh, it's a different time scale, so it's it's you know it looks like a slower change, um, and this is the Lokka Reservoir in northern Finland, which is this this example shows how man management human management can change the the kind of um, the properties temporal properties of uh, the lake level here uh, or the reservoir level. We're going from what was a reddened process, so it was slowly changing over time, to a much whiter process. And if you're a fish trying to find suitable breeding habitat in the shallows, then these sort of changes switching from a red into a white regime might have strong, strong implications for your breeding success. Um, so what do I want to say here? Oh yeah, I want to show what we know about this already. Uh, we, can, we can start to add like, fast growing population processes or slow growing population processes. So we could refer to these as red and blue dynamics as well. Um, and we want to add those to red, white, or blue environmental processes and then find out what happens in those different cases. So if we add top left red population to a blue environment, they tend to cancel each other out, right? It dampens down a little bit. So we can, we can look at the coefficient of variation of that combination of events, compare it to a red environment plus uh, red population dynamics, and we get much wider, uh, much slower dynamics and much wider fluctuations. And the same thing when you add uh, blue noise to blue dynamics or red noise to uh, red dynamics, you either amplify or suppress the resultant dynamics when you're, when you're adding these two things together. This always reminds me of my high school physics class, right? When you've got a couple of waves and you add them together, you get constructive interference. If you uh, have different wave amplitudes, not amplitudes, uh, wave lengths, then you get destructive interference. And it's, it's this very standard idea. Um, the paper by Greenman and Benton is an absolute beauty. Uh, if you're interested in these things, I recommend having a look at that because it gives a, a, a really general framework to answer these sorts of questions across a whole range of population models. Um, and we've, uh, some time ago now, Lasse Ruokalainen did his uh, PhD thesis in some of these things, and, and we find this general result repeated across uh, different scales of biological organization. We can find it in single species models and meta populations and community models, meta community models, if you want to look in there as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, all sorts of repeating patterns when you uh, add slow dynamics to slow noise or slow dynamics to fast noise, and the same with fast dynamics. Um, so the, the kind of modeling side of this is relatively well known. Uh, a few years ago, we wanted to ask how relevant is that, right? How important are different colored environmental processes in the real world when they're matched up with real organisms? So the environment that we think 
uh, is driving the populations that we see out there in the real world. And uh, David Gilliam has a, a nice paper looking at this. Um, I won't go into the frustrations. We were talking talking a tad about this. So we started with over 5,000 time series, and we did some filtering and throwing out all the unusable time series, and there was about 170 left at the end of them. So there's a massive rate of attrition when you when you dig into some of these large databases that, that ecologists like to assemble and, and interrogate afterward. Um, so yeah, there's three examples here of uh, bay checker spot butterflies. So we've only got about 10 to 15 years of, of actual data for the butterfly. We match up some environmental signal. This might be summer temperatures or spring temperatures or something like that. Um, and then we, we find some color estimate. So it's, it looks like it might be reddened, but there's a massive uncertainty around that. So we, we have to call it white noise. It's not distinguishable from white noise. If we look at the full 100 year time series of the whatever environmental COVID it was associated with that, we start to see, um, what did we start to see? Uh, yeah, it's slightly reddened again. And we reduce, just because we've got longer, more data available, uh, we reduce the confidence interval around that and it starts to look different from a white noise process. Uh, and we can do the same, the Eastern Wood Peewee, we had a bit more data coming up for 50 years of data, something like that. And it, it looks still looks like a white noise process. If we extend it to the full 100 year data set for the environmental signal or environmental variable, it starts to look, actually look like a blue noise process. And the last example is the four spotted chaser, another sort of dragonfly type thing. Um, we looked, it looked like a red environmental variable was associated with it across the, the time period that we actually had the animal data for. And if we extend that across the full 100 years uh, environmental data set, then it, it just looks like a white uh, variable. So we did that across the 170 uh, time series that we, we thought we could use. And looking at the 100 year um, environmental data sets, about 20 of them, 20% 20 of them were distinguishable from um, uh, white noise processes. Most of these were reddened. Most of them were sl only slightly reddened. Uh, and a very few of them were, were blue variables. If you went into aquatic systems, I think you would get many more um, highly reddened time series. Water doesn't change temperature as quickly as air does. Right, uh, I'm going to skip over that. OK, back to our uh, model system in the lab. So we've got stage structure here. Um, we're really interested in the larval stage, which is uh, sensitive to temperature, how quickly you can develop as a larvae in this system, because we gave them plenty of food, they weren't really food limited, um, how quickly you develop is therefore de determined by the temperature and whether or not you become parasitized by the wasp. Um, if you succeed at avoiding parasitism, you'll become a pupae and then you'll emerge as an adult, then you'll mate and lay eggs if you're a female, and the whole process starts again. Um, the, uh, the, I, I'm not sure how familiar you folks are with insect parasitoids, but if you've seen the film Alien or any of the subsequent films, it's, it's like that. The, there's a real chest burster thing going on. It's awesome. Um, right. And uh, as we know, with these kind of stage structured populations, we, we often get generation cycles or, or, or different sorts of cycles that come out of these. So we've got another non-stable empirical system here. Um, the dynamics between the host and the parasitoid are strongly coupled, so they show a high correlation between their abundance fluctuations, and we can get long-term coexistence. Steve's had these things running for years and years and years in the lab. Um, what do I want to say? Okay, so we wanted to do some short-term experiments to try and parameterize some uh, mathematical models, make sure we're not just plucking numbers out of thin air. Um, although there's a there's a, a kind of a large body of work that, that we can use to plug some of these numbers in from based on Steve's previous experiments. Um, so we looked at larval development times in a single generation, so a lot short time scale life history experiment. We looked at a range of fixed temperatures, 22 up to 30 degrees, and they were just held at that temperature for one generation. Um, and we looked at unparasitized hosts, so that's the moth larvae, um, and we followed them from being an egg to the time that they 
died or uh, emerged to adulthood, maybe I can't remember which. Um, and we also looked at the parasitized, parasitized larvae. But in that case, we're actually tracking uh, the parasitoid's larval development time. We know when the, the adult parasitoid is introduced into the experiment, it will find the, the moth caterpillar very quickly, and then it will um, it'll lay its eggs and the, the parasitoid will die. And then we'll, we're measuring how quickly the wasp larvae is developing inside the, the caterpillar, basically. Um, we also, well, we, uh, the guys in Leeds ran some experiments where they, they did the longer term population dynamic experiments. It was supposed to be across two years, um, but unfortunately there was somebody chaotic in the adjacent lab and uh, their flies got out that were infected with botulism or who the hell knows what, and, and it was catastrophic for our, our experiments, unfortunately. So they ran for a year in the end, which gave us a reasonable amount of data, about, about a year worth of data. Um, to to try and see what's going on. Um, so we've got constant environments, just a single 26 degree kind of average temperature environment. We've got red, white, and blue fluctuations, daily fluctuations in the in the in the temperature, uh, and these are drawn from a normal distribution with a known variance. It's it's ranging from about 22 up to about 30 degrees. If it gets colder than 22 degrees, then uh, they stop developing. If it gets warmer then 30 degrees and they start cooking. So we've got some natural boundaries to work with. Um, I won't go into the, uh, the, the technical details here, but we made sure that the, the red, white, and blue noises were the same temperature values, just reordered to give them that different autocorrelation structure. And that means by the end of the experiment, hopefully they, they've all experienced the same number of degree days uh, in the experiments, and, and we're not seeing differences caused by different numbers of degree days uh, in, in the insects. Um, anything else? Yeah, we just count the number of dead adults and uh, we do weekly counts of the moth, number of moth larvae. Um, right, so some results, the short term uh, single generation experiments um, to understand the mechanistic impact of, the temp of temperature change or temperature on development times. And we, we see this uh, kind of classic nonlinear response here, a J-shaped response curve. Um, showing us an optimum temperature development relationship or, or, or optimum temperature of about 28 degrees for both the host and the parasitoid. Um, the parasitoid takes a little bit longer to develop than the host, so that curve has shifted up a little bit. Um, and we, we did some statistical comparison to make sure that this, this nonlinear response really was better than any other uh, plausible uh, relationship. Um, and... We also saw loads of individual level variability in the, in the populations. They all came from the same stock population that was held at 28 degrees, maybe. Maybe that's why that's, that looks like it's the optimum, 26 or 28 degrees. And we're seeing up to 17 degrees difference in how quickly these things uh, uh, develop. So that, that in itself is quite an interesting finding. Um, we're not sure whether that's genetic or phenotypic. Uh, variability or, or plasticity, I should say. Um, we're hoping to dig into that in the future. And uh, we can plot our mathematical model predict predictions, which I'll come on to in a second. That's the, the purple curve or lilac curve here. Um, so we've got simulations for the hosts above and the parasitoids below in constant temperature environments. And at least for the host, we get a really surprisingly good correlation between the model predictions and these noisy experimental uh, uh, results. And these, these are noisy because of demographic stochasticity or observation error. It's in a constant environment, so it's not environmental variability that's leading to those changes. We've got four replicate populations up here. Uh, yeah, so they're, 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 four, they're both from the same treatment, the, the post-parasitoid treatments. So there's four replicate uh, populations, including the host and the parasitoids in the constant environment. So we're pretty happy that the, the model's doing a decent job of capturing these, uh, these empirical dynamics. This is the model. Uh, it looks deceptively simple here. Each uh, N is one of these boxes here, larval, uh, adult uh, for the host, or a, um, what do you call it? That's the parasitoid adult. So we don't, we don't, model absolutely everything, we can use 
uh, delay differential equations and, and use the delay to account for things like the larval development time or the egg. So we don't need to model those explicitly. The eggs don't do anything interesting. They just sit there until they hatch. The pupae are the same. They, they just they, you pupate and go into the cocoon and, and just uh, wait until they emerge as adults. So the, the temperature doesn't really have strong effects on either of these. The temperature is really driving larval development time. Um, not going to go through them, but this is actually what the model looks like. And even then, this, is, uh, this isn't the complete model. Um, I just want to highlight where the, the temperature feeds into the model. So a couple of places are highlighted in green, and we can have linear temperature dependent relationships or nonlinear relationships, depending on what we want to or how we want to model that. Um, and we have pages and pages of parameters that we can estimate from previous work on this, or we've estimated from our uh, new generation, single generation experiments as well. And I'm not going, uh, going into that, but it's the difference between that super simplistic model with one or two parameters that I had in the beginning and trying to capture some of the stuff that's going on in not even a real world system, like in a, a lab incubator system. Uh, it's it's mind blowing how different these things are. Um, right, so we did a good job capturing short term dynamics, we thought in constant environments. So we get these cycles over longer time periods. So a thousand days is about three years. Uh, it settles down to this, um, this nice regular cycle. If we turn on some temperature variability along the bottom and we start to see differences in the peaks and well, particularly the peaks we can see here, there are differences in the troughs as well. It's just that they're so close to zero, it's hard to see at the moment. Um, but yeah, both the host and the parasitoid show differences in their abundances, their peak and trough abundances. Maybe we see differences in the, uh, the wavelengths. We are seeing differences in the amplitudes of these cycles. Um, and we can look at, break this down to what we think might happen. If we were to repeat those uh, single generation experiments at a fixed temperature, fixed 22, fixed 26, or fixed 30 degrees Celsius, this is what the dynamics would look like if we plot larval abundance of the host against parasitoid larvae. Um, and we could, this is a kind of, in my mind, a, an approach that's used experimentally quite often, right? We want to compare how fish behave in water that's held at 22 degrees versus 26 degrees, right? A big step change. Um, or 22 versus 30 degrees, if we really want to show a strong effect size. Um, and then we're, we're going to in, 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 mm, extrapolate from those kind of step jump constant temperature experiments to see what happens. And what we find when we do this is there's a tiny change in the maximum host abundances, larval abundances in this case, but we see a much larger change as we increase temperature in the maximum parasitoid abundances. Um, and I've given some number here, some numbers here, so we see a 2.42 increase in the minimum for the parasitoids, I think. We see a big shift in the whole cycle up for parasitoids. Uh, slightly less, but still fairly large increase in the maximum abundances. Uh, we hardly see any increase in the maximum abundances of the hosts, but we see a much bigger increase in the minimum host abundance as well. So different points of the cycle are moving in different ways um, according to constant temperature environment simulation experiments. Right. Uh, once we turn the, the environmental variability on, we start to see some wobbling around some sort of cycling attractor. So it looks fairly familiar. It doesn't look that different. We're still seeing that, that cycle. We're seeing coexistence between them is maintained. And again, this is about a five-year simulation that we're running here. And we want to ask how the stochastic simulation um, relates to the step change predictions. Has anyone got any guesses? Oh, and you've seen this before, so you don't, you're not allowed to say anything. We did really well with the, the original deterministic model and the experimental data. I'm, I'm going to uh, give you the answer. Basically, what we would expect is, what I would have expected is the, the, the pink lines to track the black line and wobble about that, right? The black line is the mean temperature across that five-year period, 26 degrees. But what we see are uh, massive increases way above the maximum temperature that we, uh, I've got these reversed maybe. That should see 30 and 22, doesn't matter. Way above the, um, 
the densities that we, we would have expected if we'd only run these constant temperature experiments, even though it's a simulation framework. Um, so that's a, a sort of surprising emergent dynamic that comes when you add the noise into the system. In this case, these are, this is a red environment, so it's, it's changing slowly, but not, you know, it, we're talking about in the scale of days, not in the scale of years that these changes happen. So, um, yeah, we shouldn't, I wouldn't have expected to see such big increases in parasoid, parasitoid densities away from the, the, the mean temperatures or even in, in host densities. We start to see, even we hardly saw any changes um, in the, the kind of constant environments, but now we're seeing big changes in these stochastic environments. Um, what, what sort of things are we seeing? Increased pest outbreaks. Uh, that's the pest is the moth species, even when we're, we're still seeing very high parasitoid or biocontrol agent densities. Um, this, we're sort of trying to get our heads around whether this is some sort of phenological mismatch. Are we, are we shifting the, the angle of this cycle around just a little bit so that, uh, so that, that, that gives some release from the parasitoid for the host or the, the large parasitoid abundances? We've not quite got our heads around that. We may be seeing enhanced coexistence because we're dragging everybody up and away from the, from the zero point, from the extinction point in this, uh, in this simulation. Do we see the same things in blue uh, or white noise? Not really. Um, they tend to do what I would have expected before. They tend to track that mean temperature much better than the, uh, the red noises. Um, so, so, yeah, if we, are, if we find ourselves uh, moving to more reddened environments in the natural world, then maybe we're going to see larger outbreaks of pests or less control or phenological mismatch uh, between pests and their, their kind of species that are supposed to control them. Um, how much time have I got? Are you trying? Not much, right? It's okay, I don't have a lot of slides. Basically, we can, we can dig into the mechanisms behind that, which are related to the understanding the distribution of development times in the larvae. And we see that the, uh, the, the red environments the mean development time I've given by these, um, yeah, these long red lines here, they, that shifted down a little bit. So the, the, even though they're fluctuating uh, more widely in terms of the, the, dis the variance in their development times, the mean seems to be shifted to faster development times uh, for both the host and the parasitoid. Um, if we look at things in the host alone version, we go back to um, the uh, what are we going back to the the, the 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 dynamics are tracking the mean temperature much better than in the host parasitoid version. So it looks like there's some interaction between the host and its parasitoid and the um, what else density dependence survival either through competition or parasitism and the uh, the, the variation in temperatures. Um, so there's what I said here, interaction between recruitment, density independent and density dependent survival, and this correlation between the host and parasitoid abundances. So there'll be periods when they've both got um, high abundances uh, and periods when they both got low abundances. And I think that's dragging the ends of these distributions out. Um, gone too far back. Uh, and I'm not saying this very clearly. But, oh yeah, that's the whole point. That's why I've got these charming fellows up here. There's a double whammy of, uh, of these temperature and uh, various biological mechanisms that are, that are kicking in to, to amplify the, the cycle in unexpected ways. It's not just being amplified about the mean. So I, I wanted to double check if that happens in much simpler host parasitoid models. And the short answer is it doesn't seem to. We seem to track the mean temperature as well. Uh, pretty in a pretty standard way for a simpler version of the host parasitoid model. So that suggests that having that kind of added complexity of the, the temperature dependent development life history stage is, is key to helping us understand what's going on here. Right, so to conclude uh, this part, I think I've shown that we can get these emergent surprising dynamics in the cycling unstable host parasitoid system. 
which goes beyond the stable equilibrium or the stable cyclic attractor predictions. Um, scaling up from uh, short-term experiments doesn't necessarily predict these outbreak dynamics. So we've got to be a little bit careful when we're doing those sorts of fixed temperature experiments and then trying to extrapolate about what might be happening in the real world. Um, we didn't find that uh, that emergent behavior in the host alone model. Here I'm plotting yeah, host, host abundances across time. Um, and it seems to track the mean temperature much better than it does in the host parasitoid model. And it wasn't found in simpler host parasitoid models either uh, because it was lacking that mechanistic temperature development time pathway. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop there. I think with uh, the, this beautiful photo taken by Ed, the, the lab technician who uh, runs his own photography company now. So if you want to buy nice photographs, get in touch with Ed. Thank you very much for your attention. Here we go. Thanks, Mike. That was that was really great. Um, Steve was in charge of the undergrad program when I went through Leeds. So actually, the, the Plodia papers was well, the first scientific paper I ever read, which is fun. So nice to see, actually see a talk on this. He, uh, he emailed me last night and yeah. said to tell you hello. Oh, great. <laughs> um, any any talks? Any questions for for Mike? Uh, we've got maybe five minutes. So the. Um effect you saw in the complex model, but not the simpler models. It strikes me that another thing that you had in the complex models was that delay. And I'm wondering if, right, if you have a red, if you have a red noise environment, your conditions now, say it's warm now, it's likely was also warm what tau time steps ago. Yeah. And so you're sort of doubling the impact of the environment at any given time. So I sort of I, I buy your explanation about temperature dependent development, but I also wonder if there's something about the fact that your complex model has a lag in it that made red noise really kind of wildly different. Yeah, so actually the noise affects that tau directly. So that's 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 what's changing with the noise. Um, so it, it doesn't exclude uh, your suggestion at all. I need to think very carefully about it, um, but. What might go against it uh, a little bit is that this is a discrete time model, so there is a lag in there. Temperature isn't affecting the lag, but it the, there is a time lag in there. So, it, yeah. Um, well, let's talk more about this because it, it might be it's something that's sort of stumping us a little bit to come up with a really, really convincing explanation about. Any other questions? Um, okay, then I'm going to ask a naive and badly formulated one. Um, so you're seeing this effect of red noise, like the responses to red noise seem to be different relative to the mean, to the mean in these two species systems. Yeah. Uh, so. Do you think it's red noise particularly that is causing this compared to the others simply because it's slower and they're better able to track environmental change? Or is that way too simplistic of a so, way of thinking about it? One of the things we've been doing recently is digging into this, uh, how the noise affects these time series of larval development times. Um, and based on what I showed at the, the sort of start of the second half of this, we expect amplification to happen probably with the, the red noise. Um, what, we, what we see is the underlying part of the equation that controls larval development time is, is slow, right? So we're Yes, we're getting amplification here. That's what we see here, right? These, these are wider distributions in red than in white than in blue environments. Um, why it's over, what did I say, over five years, why it, it shoves the mean down isn't quite so clear. And, and also, 
why oh, what we've also seen is that actually this black line if you look at the autocorrelation of that it's red and so even though it's a white environment the, the interaction of the environment with the slow biology results in a, a red, reddened larval development time, even though it's a white environment. And the blue one is also red, right? So uh, uh, it was an excellent question to allow me to elaborate on that. And, and actually, one of the things we've, we've the postdoc, the new postdoc Christoph is working on um, is, is, uh, there's a paper by Stuart Pym and Redfern, Redfern and Pym in the 80s on why, every, not why, but on the fact that everything, all, not all, many natural time series are reddened. And Christoph is sort of showing that it's, it's almost inevitable. As long as you have noise filtering through some biological process, it's almost inevitable that you end up with a reddened time series. Um, so that that's kind of these things that are linked together. We, it would be very hard to make the temperature so blue that you end up with anything other than a reddened larval development time series. But that doesn't explain that the, the that, that sort of says well actually these things should be more similar. They shouldn't behave so differently. If they're all red, it doesn't matter what noise you throw at them, they should all be red. So there's some yeah we're still missing some some parts of this story. Um, red, white, and blue. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's a, that's a, that was an important part because I've, I've done some work previously that shows that just with the standard methods of generating colored noise, um, you can also generate like a red, the distribution of a red noise process that you've generated with the autoregressive, first order autoregressive equation, that'll have a wildly different distribution to a blue noise process generated with the same equation with a different parameter value, right? Uh, over finite time scales, over even 10,000 time steps or something like that. So it should have settled to a normal distribution by then, but they don't always. So I, I borrowed a method that Owen was in, involved with developing some years ago, uh, and uh, made sure that the not these values, but the values of the temperature that will result in these values, they are all the same values, just reordered to be red, white, or blue. Um, Dave's got a question. No, maybe this is a bit naive, and you've already thought a lot about it, but I mean, is there a body of theory, maybe more mathematical in origin on the uh, role of colored noise on Jensen's inequality and how that might have played into non in, not this nonlinear averaging and sort of how, you know, it seems like the red, the red noise time series has, you know, it, it, it has these, it has this bimodality that seems like a natural consequence of just the slowness of it moving across those nonlinear surfaces. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm going to answer your question. So Jensen's inequality uh, is, is about nonlinear biological responses, right? And how, um, I'm not sure if this is it exactly, but the way, the way we've been thinking about this is that right, if, you, if you're at your mean value and the temperature is fluctuating either side of that, um, Uh, I don't want to go down this route. It just seems like the residence time of your of your temperature mm -hmm. at those tail ends of you know the lower and the higher values where it's most nonlinear could result in that bimodality, which would then result in that higher variance. Yeah. I mean, I, I, is it is it more nonlinear up here than it is here? Well, it, it's just it's averaging over more nonlinearity, more slowly. It's not kind of randomly bouncing between points. I, see, I don't know. You could probably just tool up an easy simulation yeah, yeah, to figure so. that out. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. That's 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 probably part of what uh, Christoph is trying to dig into with this this idea of doesn't matter what noise you put in, what color noise you 
pretend because of a biological process, some typically non-linear process, it's going to come out as red. So yeah, I think these things are, are related. Um, it's something we're trying to dig into. Yeah, good point. Awesome. Uh, we're, we're pretty out of time. Maybe you can chat afterwards. Is, is that all right? I want to let everyone go. What, who needs to go? Thanks. Uh, okay, thank you, Mike. Cheers. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for